so as a few of you know, I actually gave a talk here uh, almost a year ago. Um, and actually, Liana invited me and wrote a, I guess I thought I sent her an abstract, but she didn't see it and wrote a much more interesting ab abstract, or at least seemed kind of interesting. So I actually talked on that, which was on human intuition, decision analysis, and the value of information. And today, I'm going to, as you can see what I'm going to be talking about, which was actually the original abstract that I had sent. And um, I guess uh, it must be a sucker of punishment to invite me back yet again. But anyway, I feel very honored to, to be here. Um, so first, I'd like to get a sense of uh, you know, who I'm speaking with here. Um, so I'd like you to kind of put up your hand um, as to which of these titles best describes you. There is a dot, dot, dot at the end in which you can volunteer something else. But um, analytics practitioner. OK, so I guess about four. Data scientist. OK, about six. Uh, software developer, about, I don't know, 12. You can see I'm very numerate here. Uh, computer scientist, OK, about eight. <laughs> and uh, decision scientist, about three, four. And dot, 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 something else. You want to, anybody want to shout out, like, what, the, what, they, who they, what they do? Anthropologist. <laughs> Thank you. Project manager. Biz dev. Great. Thanks. Analytics product manager. Great. Thanks. So, um, I mean, this talk is kind of aimed at, well, I guess all of those people, but particularly people who do analytics, modeling, um, decision science. Um, and, you know, I did notice a few people put up their hands more than once, which is entirely appropriate. I think I would have put up my hand for each of those, and some other dot, dot, dots that I will not mention today. Um, so OK, so <clears throat> it won't surprise you, since you saw the title of my talk, that this is kind of where I'm starting. You know, most big data analytics projects fail, um, or at least they fail to provide real business value. So, well, first of all, I should ask, how many of you think that's true from your own experience? OK. Maybe about a third, perhaps. And how many of you think that's false you know, from what you've seen in your own experience? Two. OK. So we have sort of a majority, but a weak majority, shall we say. So, this isn't just like me mouthing off, um, although it might be that too. There, you know, Gartner Research, and uh, Gartner Research is actually just in the building across the way, I noticed. As many of you might know, they're kind of an industry research analyst. They look at the tech industry um, to see you know, what's going on there. And in particular, they've done studies of, in the last few years, of you know, big data, data analytics, projects at large companies for the most part. And in 2016, they estimated that 60% of the big data projects fail to provide business value. And then the next year, they revised their estimate. And they said, oops, no, we got that wrong. Uh, I think it's more like 85%. And I don't know whether the 2016 study was included as one of the failures in that 2017 study. Anyway, that's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> um, and there was an article in the Harvard Business Review, uh, which they, they looked at about 36 large companies that had major data science, data analytics initiatives over a period of time. They looked at them over a period of three years. And at the end of that time, concluded that only, well, slightly more than one in three of them had met the objectives of the analytics uh, of the, the, over, the, over that period. So, um, 
So and Gartner, as some of you might know, has this concept of the trough of disillusionment. So you know, they have this curve where sometimes called the hype cycle. You know, first, and this started, what, about five, six, seven years ago, seven years ago, eight years ago, kind of big data and machine learning and so on. Suddenly, you know, huge enthusiasm. And, and then typically, and this isn't just about data science, it's kind of whatever they're looking at, they go through kind of a trough of disillusionment. And so the question is, are we due for that now in this area? I don't know, but, um, and then what they say normally happens is if this thing pans out, which I think is pretty clear, then there's a slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity, you know, when it just becomes a normal thing and there's not, you know, it's not, not so exciting, but it just delivers value. So maybe that's what we can expect. So, so my question is, well, if it's true that, you know, we can argue about the exact percentage, but if it's true that a lot of these projects fail to deliver business value, why is that? Yes? People are terrible estimators. <laughs> People are terrible estimators and Okay. Software development. Right. So, so you'd say it's kind of like a generalization of general software development. You know, most software projects fail or at least take way longer and more money than was estimated. So that's definitely part of it, I'm sure. Yes. You're saying that, you know, with a software project, you can tell whether it's feasible. With data analytics, you don't really know if it's going to be feasible until you start to do it. I think that's an interesting point. Yes. Uh, we we'll only have one more. Quick question. Yes. Actually, uh, what you mean by fail? Well, <clears throat> so fail to deliver business value. So I guess what that means is that, you know, the business side, the people that are trying to, you know, make decisions, at least that's the way I look at it, trying to get insights and make decisions from the, the analysis of the data feel that it didn't really help. I think that, that's the criterion. So and anyway, the, the reason that Gartner gives is you know, management resistance and internal politics. So we have confirmation here from somebody in the trenches that that's what happens, and that a lot of people are too afraid to actually say that is what's going on. And the Harvard Business Review study basically said something similar insufficient organizational alignment, lack of middle management adaption, adoption, understanding, and business resistance. So I'm sure that this is true in terms of you know, what's going on, perception, especially from the data analytics groups. But I kind of have a concern about this. So you know, I've been a as Lonnie mentioned, I've been kind of a consultant, among other things, for quite a long time. A decision analyst, I guess I like to call myself. And it's not uncommon that I feel that my client is like a little bit obtuse and their organization is a bit dysfunctional. And like, how come they don't appreciate our advice? But when I start to feel that, I remind myself, well, you know, my job as a consultant is to help these people, help this organization make better decisions. And if they don't find my advice useful, well, whose fault is that? Really, it's mine. Um, you know, I need to understand the world from that perspective and provide the information or the analysis, um, the tools that are really going to help them. Uh, and you know, complaining that they don't really understand the wonderful analysis that I've done really is kind of, um, you know, how far is that going to get me? So, so you know, my question is, should we be blaming our clients for this? Um, and 
conversely, how can we provide real value to our clients? And um, so, so my thesis is that it's really about engaging more effectively with our clients. And, and I'm going to talk a bit about, well, what I mean by engaging, what kind of tools are available, what kind of methods can help this work more effectively. And I'm going to illustrate it with a couple of examples. The first one that Lonnie mentioned, uh, decommissioning California's offshore oil platforms, and also a little bit on a project we did for the Department of Energy over 10 years, developing models for looking at the future of the automobile fleet in the US and wh what kind of policies might affect adoption of new technologies like electric vehicles, um, biofuels, hydrogen, and so on. So first thing, I probably should say a word about what I mean by client. So um, ultimately, somebody who's making decisions that matter, that you are hopefully trying to help. And oftentimes, that might be your boss or senior executives at your organization. Or if you're a consulting company, you know, you're consulting clients at other organizations. And it could be one person, but usually it's a team of people. Um, even if there's like one senior executive, maybe a CEO who's ultimately making the decision, there is a whole team of other people that works with him or her, um, stakeholders and so on that care about it, that probably have a lot of input if that CEO is paying attention. And it, or if you're building a decision support tool, um, it could be you know, end users. Or it could actually be you if you are you know, doing some analysis for yourself. And I strongly advise doing that. There's nothing like being your own client that helps you think about what clients think about the analysis and like what makes results useful or not. So, um, so <laughs> this, this slide is really kind of, in a certain sense, encapsulates the core part of the message. Yes? Um, actually, one clarifying question. When you're talking about data analysis, yes. is the data you're talking about only text data or also voice data and video data? Um, it's any kind of data. Voice, you know, numbers, text. I mean, whatever it is that is available that you can analyze that is relevant to the problem at hand. And actually, that relevance part of it is kind of the, a core part of the issue where in many cases. Because um, you know, a company increasingly has humongous amounts of data, but then they want to help make a decision about whether to launch a new product or buy a company. And the question is, how much of the data they have is really going to help them? Sometimes it is relevant, but um, that's kind of a question. Um, and I'm not going to be talking a lot about kind of the practice of analytics in terms of you know, whether you should be using conventional statistics, machine learning. Um, or, you know, I'm going to take it that you guys already know about that really well. That's, uh, that's really important, really interesting to me, uh, uh, but that's not what I'm going to be focusing on today. I'm going to be focusing about, well, the relationships. Okay, So what do I mean? So there's the world. Okay, The world is infinitely complicated, but our models, even if we have humongous amounts of data, are extremely simple, and we can only model small bits of the world. And so there's a relationship between the world. You know, It might be our company, the business environment it's working in. Um, it might be a physical system, whatever it is. And some kind of model built around data, ideally, but also built around human intelligence. Um, you know, what do we, how do we think the world works? We might build systems dynamics models. We might do decision analysis based partly on expert judgment, not just on data. But 
OK, there's something missing. So first, the analyst. That's me or you, um, maybe a team that's looking at the world, trying to figure out what's in it, look at the data, building a model. And there's something critical missing here, when you can guess what that is right now. The client, again, could be your boss, could be an actual consulting client. And the relationship, the engagement between you as analyst and, and the client. And you'll see this analyst um, is kind of looking at his computer, definitely not looking out there at his client or at us. You know, he's kind of like, well, kind of like me and probably quite a few of you. He's kind of a, a geek. I mean, if you hope you won't be too offended if I use that word. Um, but we have to become empaths, that is, somebody that can get inside the head of our client and try to think about the way they look at the world. And for some of us, that's kind of challenging. I mean, I would say it was for me when I started out in this. Um, but I found it interesting and worked at it. And so I think the good news is, although I've been criticized for saying this, but I think that for people who have mastered kind of the hard skills of you know, numbers and equations and math and software um, can uh, learn these soft skills. And arguably, what I've been criticized for is saying it's actually a bit easier for us than the other way around. Um, anyway, so, so that's kind of the main point here. But I'm going to go into a few um, particular methods that technical methods, tools in, in, in large part, that we can use to help this process of engagement. So I'm going to use what, this example from Controversy to Consensus, which is this m project that Lonnie mentioned of how to um, decommission California's offshore oil platforms. And there's 27 of these platforms off the coast of Southern California. Some of you might have seen them off Santa Barbara or LA. Um, and they're at the end of their lives. They aren't producing gas or oil much anymore. And the original leases said that the oil companies have to remove them entirely when they're done. And so we were asked um, part, as part of a team to kind of put together some analysis, not really recommendations, but analyze the options and look at the science and economics and engineering and law, marine biology and so on, and try to put that together. And here's a map of where you see those blue dots and red dots. Those are the offshore oil platforms. Uh, they look small there. Uh, a few of you might have been around in 1969 when there was this massive oil spill, which was kind of the deep water horizon of its day um, in 1969, which is Part of the reason that anything to do with offshore oil in California is extremely controversial, even for those that don't remember this hideous event. And the other thing to know is that these things are really, really huge. And what you see there is just the tip of the iceberg, kind of literally, because underwater, they have this structure, in many cases, a 1,000 foot long. This is part of Platform Harmony before it was installed. And if you can see, like, there's a crane here. And anyway, it's, it's big. So getting these things out is kind of expensive. Um, and they kind of look like this. So I don't know if any of you are divers, but you know, divers actually, it's, it's quite popular to go and dive the rigs, because under them, they're coated with marine life, uh, coral and shellfish, and you know, then fish come and breed there, and then the sea lions come and eat the fish, and then the humans come and watch what's going on. So it's quite a world there. But you can imagine like taking out one of those structures when it's got a, another 18 inches of marine uh, a crust incrustation is kind of challenging. So OK, so I talked about a team of stakeholders, our clients. So 
our immediate client for this was the California Ocean Science Trust, um, but they basically served a kind of coordinating role among all the different stakeholders. So there's a bunch of government agencies like the California Natural Resources Agency, um, the operators like Chevron of some of the platforms, um, commercial sport fishing interests, um, environmental groups that are very concerned about this, um, and recreational divers, both human and otherwise, who have strong opinions on the topic. Um, so, so, okay, so I'm just kind of going into this particular example to kind of flesh out like some of the issues in a kind of concrete way. But, and you know, you, your clients may be, you know, your senior execs in your company perhaps, um, maybe they don't have sea lions in their stakeholder group, but I'm sure there's people that, you know, shout occasionally, hopefully not, but, uh, you know, and some of the issues can be quite complex and, and controversial. So first step, which is, sounds like way too simple to be even worth mentioning, you know, ask questions and listen. And so <clears throat> about 20 years ago, I asked uh, this guy that worked for a large utility company that shall remain nameless, um, the stupid consultant question, what keeps you up at night? And he said, hey, nothing keeps me up at night. I work for a utility. <clears throat> so that was then. I don't think they feel the same way nowadays, <laughs> especially not around here. Um, so, so, but, you know, active listening. Probably many of you are aware, you know, you ask your client what they care about, what they're looking for, what decisions they're thinking about, what they're hoping to get out of the project. And you restate to them what you just heard. Um, that's kind of active listening to make sure they understand what uh, you, un they know that you understood what they said, or if you didn't, they'll correct you. And look at nonverbal cues as well. You know, is this something they really care about? Is there maybe a hidden thing that they're not quite being explicit about that maybe you need to dig for? Um, you know, don't assume that your clients, first of all, know exactly what they want. I mean, you want to ask them what they want, but sometimes part of the job is helping them figure out what's possible, what you could provide that they, they you might be able to provide stuff that they, that is actually more useful than they thought you could do, but you have to explain that to them. Or maybe they think you can provide something that you actually can't provide. Again, something you need to explain. So, um, so, and this is typically, well, one model of consulting is, okay, I go to my client, ask him or her, what, you know, what do you need? When do you need it? How much resources are there? Okay, you go away you know, crunch the data, come back with some graphs and charts and maybe a report and a PowerPoint, you know, a few months later, and that's it. Okay. I mean, I'm caricaturing, and I'm sure you all know that's not really how things work. It needs to be an iterative process. So there's like clients, there may be a group of clients, and a, often a group of people on the analytics team. And to work effectively, there needs to be kind of constant interaction through a series of stages. I mean, they may or may not have the names that, here, but, but the key point is that it's an interactive process because it's only through that ongoing decision dialogue that you really understand what they care about and they really understand what you can provide and hopefully converge on something useful. So um, these questions are things that I borrowed from this book, Asking is Better Than Telling, uh, from Catherine Rosbeck, which I found quite useful. Um, kind of engage, you know, first, well, what's your organization's biggest problem? Um, that kind of thing. How could analytics contribute? Then explore, what are the objectives? What decisions could the analytics inform? 
and what are the key uncertainties. And you'll see these nodes, if you haven't seen them before, have a conventional shape from influence diagrams, and I'll get into that in more detail. Um, so I'm kind of a bit literal-minded, so when I hear about dashboards, I like, oh, okay, a dashboard. So here's a dashboard. Okay, so I'm going to making a point here that some of you will find obvious, but some of you might have seen, but I think some of you probably will see that it's kind of deeper than it, than it appears at first. So, okay, here's the dashboard. We have a rear view mirror, okay? And our descriptive analytics are all about analyzing the data that we have, and the data that we have is only from the past. I mean, we haven't yet figured out how to get data from the future. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a, well, well. So, so, and the thing is, if you spend all your time on focusing on data from the past, like, you're not really seeing where you're going. So, you know, maybe you have a GPS, you know, predictive analytics that can help you forecast the future based on various forecasting techniques, maybe systems dynamics modeling, maybe various things. There's still something kind of missing from this car, and it's not autonomous, by the way. And so, I mean, pretty obvious, okay? So this is only interesting, both the rear view mirror stuff and the GPS is only useful if we're gonna do something with it, like decide where are we gonna drive to. And that's what I call decision analytics. So it's only, so analytics, just to really kind of belabor the point, analytics have no value until they help you make a better decision. I mean, they might be interesting, you might get some insights, but until it informs a decision, like, you know, what's the point? It's kind of depressing in the end for us. I mean, some of us really enjoy doing the analytic stuff and generating cute graphs. I mean, I think I enjoy that. But ultimately, like, if no one is really, like, making a change, uh, making a decision based on it, you know, why are we doing this? And so we have descriptive analytics, um, you know, in the oil, in the oil platform case, you can think about, well, if you're trying to estimate the cost of removing those oil platforms, um, you can look at places they've done it before in the Gulf of Mexico. But California is different, regulatory different, water is deeper, and you have to get the crane barges all the way around South America to bring them here from the North Sea and or wherever they are right now. Kind of, so everything is a little bit different. So you can't just take that data, you have to adjust it. And that's where the predictive analytics comes in. Okay, how do we adjust it? Um, and the decision analytics, you know, ultimately, how will this help us better make decisions? So, for example, I mean, this is kind of what ended up happening in this example. Uh, instead of completely removing the platform, which is what the lease is required, so it required a change in the law, consider leaving the support structure with its teeming band of fish and marine life in place but just cut off the top so it's not a hazard to shipping. Um, so I sh showed you those node types, um, objective, decision, uncertainty, and data. So those are the elements of a decision of an influence diagram. Actually, we added data. The decision analysts that came up with these didn't really do that, but it's kind of important. Um, and here's a kind of example for a simple uh, model where you're trying to price a product, decide on its marketing budget. Those are the green decision rectangles. And there's some intermediate variables. Um, there's an objective net present value, which we're trying to maximize. 
perhaps you have a more sophisticated measure of value with multiple objectives. Um, the arrows are influences. It just says, OK, that variable depends on these others. And at this level, it's purely qualitative. Um, but we can draw this up, these diagrams up with our clients. And even you know, fairly non-quantitative people can easily understand what this diagram means and, and contribute to it. Say, well, hey, there's another decision you haven't got in here. There's another uncertainty you need to put in there. So it's, some, it's a representation that you can use with a variety of people and also technical people in kind of structuring like the things that your client cares about and is interested in. And you can dig down into the modules and there might be sub diagrams. And uh, in this case, the ovals are chance variables, things, numbers that you're uncertain about that you have to estimate, maybe from data, maybe from expert judgment. And influence diagrams were developed by decision analysts originally just for as kind of tools for graphic facilitation. So you can sit around a computer with a group and you know, try to figure out, OK, well, what needs to be in this? And um, because of the node shape reminds you that you have to identify each node. Well, is this a decision? Is this something that we, my company, or the decision maker can change? Or is it an uncertainty which is like we don't have direct control over it. And oddly enough, that distinction is really quite challenging to make sometimes. I mean, think about, you know, for an electric power company, is the price of electricity their decision? Well, it's clearly not, you know, as a rate payer, my decision. Well, if you know anything about the regulatory structure, it's kind of a little unclear exactly who makes those decisions. It's kind of a process. Um, but the goal of this exercise is to build a shared representation, a shared understanding of the things that matter, um, the things that are uncertain, the decisions, the objectives, with your clients. so that, And you can draw this up together. And um, you know, it, it's, it takes a little bit of practice to learn how to do it, but in the basic concepts are pretty intuitive. And it's, and even if some of the node, I mean, later on we may go back and put in quantitative models underlying each of the relations, maybe probability distributions, maybe conditional dependency, maybe just simple accounting relations. Um, maybe whole computer programs. But you know, that's what we do as analysts. But if we started out with a representation that we've shared with our client, then we can get a lot further. So here's an example of a top level diagram that we put together for the oil rig issue. So the vertical column is uh, eight um, at what decision analysts call attributes, really objectives or things that people care about. Not everybody cares about them the same amount, but they represent the things that collectively all the stakeholders care about, at least some of them. And then there's the, the decommissioning options, so the decisions. So here we've just represented it in a kind of very abstract, a single green rectangle, but we can open it up and see, OK, there's a whole decision tree inside of here. We could do complete removal, like the leases require. And then there's various options about how we do the removal. You know, we can use explosions. We, where do we dispose it? And so on and so on. And then, or we could leave it in place. You know, maybe we could reuse these platforms and put wind turbines on them. That would be kind of cool, because we're taking these monuments to uh, fossil fuels and making them into renewables. Unfortunately, it didn't quite pan out technically and economically. But And then there's kind of the intermediate option, partial removal. You chop the top off and leave the rest. So you know, this is just a very specific example of structuring some decisions. You know, yours might be quite different, but I think you 
get the picture of how you might do that. And then I'm going to dig into one of these others, the economic cost. So each of these things we can dig into, but not today. Um, and there's an influence diagram here that we put together working with an oil rig engineer who understands the costs of deconstructing or de uh, decommissioning these things. And we sat down with him. Well, I didn't, but one of my staff did. Spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out all the components and how to put it together. So, and we, uh, at, at Luminar, our analytica software actually uses these influence diagrams as its primary representation for structuring models and for navigating and documenting them. And this is an example of a model uh, for the A-team thing that I mentioned, looking at long-range automobile policy for the US. This was kind of back when we had an administration that was interested in policies like this. Well, maybe they're still interested, just in the other direction. Um, and it looked at the auto US automobile fleet and said, well, there's this kind of turnover. If people adopt electric vehicles or hydrogen at this rate, well, first of all, what would determine that? And then what effect would that have on greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, certainly no longer of interest to some people, and um, costs of transportation and oil and gas imports or exports. So we can, this is actually the top level of a hierarchical module. Here is his kind of part of that hierarchy. We can kind of dig into that module and then dig into the next module and so on. And within that, there's a model with you know, several thousand variables. But at the top level, it's something that the policy folks can understand and relate to and have input to. Or hopefully, even inside, if they want to go to that level of detail. And it provides kind of a clarity of documentation of the structure that uh, is kind of missing from typical, you know, if you write it in Python or, or Fortran or whatever. So, OK. So one of the hardest questions when you're doing analytics and modeling is like how much time to put into it? How complex should it be? So I'm kind of curious if anybody wants to volunteer, like from, their exper from your experience, you know, how do you make that decision? What determines when you're doing some analytics work, you know, how much detail you go into? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the value of the problem that you're solving, right, how much value could it provide if it works out well? That's a great answer. Thank you. Yes. How much time you have left. How much time you have left. Yes. I think that's a very practical answer that most of us can relate to. Yes. It depends on your audience. It depends on your audience. Absolutely. You know, who's your client? What do they care about? One more. Yes. So does your, you want to make sure that your model captures all the basic drivers, that, the key things. I mean, the problem is the world is infinitely complex, and we have to leave a lot out. Well, huge amount out. And we can only put a small amount in. Yes. Sorry? You might need some extra experts, yeah. Right, can you find the right expert? Yeah. So anyway, here's a you know, few answers I've got for this. You know, how much data do you have? What is, how complex is the problem? Um, the amount of uncertainty, and this is interesting. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the power of your tools you know, and your computers, you know, do you have massive cluster of you know, supercomputer available to you, your computational resources, human resources. You know, how much time do you have? We can relate to that. And you know, what's needed to make a decision? That's kind of an important one. And 
Um, the main point I want to make here is that this green rectangle model size is a I put it as a decision variable. It's like our, as analysts, as data scientists, as decision scientists, it's our decision variable. We get to decide that at least, uh, you know, we might need to talk about the resources with our clients. And it's not, you know, it, I, I think those decisions are often not made in a very conscious way. And I think that often ends up with problems. So, so there's a few um, wise men who have uh, opined on this topic. Um, so Einstein famously said, or is supposed to have said, a theory should be as simple as possible, but no simpler which is you know, really cute and cool, but of course it kind of leaves a little bit unstated about how you figure out like, what as simple as possible really means, which is kind of what we're trying to get at. And then there's John Muir, who some of you might know as a naturalist who uh, was instrumental in founding Yosemite and Muir Woods and so on. And he has this wonderful quote when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it's hitched to everything else in the universe. And that's kind of what makes our life so difficult because you know, there are, you know, we are always gonna be leaving out a lot of connections in our analysis and models. And that's just, you know, that's our job, leaving stuff out basically. But hopefully, you know, keeping in the stuff that matters and that's the question. So um, there's another guy, uh, Cecil Northcott Parkinson, who's not so famous nowadays, but he was like a very well-known early management theorist who was asked, you know, for a government agency or a company, you know, how many people work there and how many people need to work there? And his, he says, well, Parkinson's law, work expands to fill the time available. And I think this is kind of, I have a corollary to that law, which I think applies to computer models, which is computer models ex expand, exhaust the computer and human resources available. And you know, when I look at the size of a lot of models, that's kind of pretty much the criterion that's used for deciding on, on how large they are. And I'm, I mean, you've probably all had this experience, like, you know, well, those of you who've been around for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, remember that computers were like, you know, not that powerful in those days. Every project we do seems to require just a little bit more than our current cycles computers can handle. And then like two years later, that, you know, twice as much, or you know, 10 years later there, I forget what the number is, but you know, and somehow they're still not enough. I mean, why is that? You know, that's not, that's because we're using this criterion, which is really not necessarily the right one. So what should we be doing? Okay, so, so those of you that are software developers are very familiar with agile software development. And agile analytics is really kind of a similar concept, probably somewhat familiar to many of you. And I, but I think if one thinks about it, more explicit. This kind of really is a major part of the answer here. So, you know, we start out by briefly defining our needs, working with our client, figuring out their objective. I mean, it still might be an in-depth conversation with our clients, but not exhaustive requirement setting. You know, that went out with the waterfall method. Build a rapid prototype that at least works and gives you some insight maybe. Maybe the insight as to why that is insufficient. Or maybe it turns out the simple prototype is enough. Test it with your client. And also do sensitivity analysis to figure out, okay, well, I made these assumptions here. What if I changed them? How much if difference would that have? Now, that's something that you can't do with conventional software for the most part. But if you're doing analytics and modeling, that's really, really valuable. And so it's really great to be able to, to do that. With a quantitative modeling package, you should be able to. 
And then obviously, based on those insights, like what your client thinks of it, you know, is it missing some crucial things? Is it, are the new decisions that need to be in there? And your sensitivity analysis, identifying which uncertainties or which assumptions really make a difference, that guides you into where to expand it. And the thing is, our intuition, including my own, is like not good about knowing what is going to matter in a model. Well, that's my experience. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, you know, user interface designers, like they go in to the profession with lots of ideas about what makes a good user interface. If they've been around for a while and they're paying attention, they discover that you learn a whole lot more by experiments than you do by, you know, from your expectations, you know, evidence-based software development, if you like. And, you know, iterate until your clients are satisfied or, you know, it may be still till you run out of time. But the good thing is that if you take the iterative process, you already have a, de a fairly decent model by the time you run out of time. Whereas if you only are still on the first cycle when you run out of time, you are hosed. Okay, so here's an example of a sensitivity analysis for those that might not be familiar. Sometimes this, there's many ways of doing sensitivity analysis. This is kind of a simple way, sometimes called a tornado chart, which may or may not be obvious from what it looks like. So this is an example from the platform decommissioning model. There's a whole bunch of parameters down the left side of the graph. These are uncertain quantities. In this case, mostly like how much different people care about different objectives. And you take them from a low possible value to a high possible value to see um, what the difference is. This is looking at the difference between partial removal and complete removal, two main decisions we were looking at. Yes. So how do you, how do you know that you've got all the variables? And is it also all the data that you might need? Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's no simpler way that I know to do that. But, um, but you know, going through this agile iterative process will you'll learn as you go through it hopefully what you know where you're missing stuff that turns out to be important right so you're looking at the success metrics and um so yes i mean that's important we we we're, we we need to be defining our objectives very clearly um as i talked about a little bit in this example i mean talk a lot about it but there was that pile of eight objectives that people cared about. And actually, this, this chart kind of illustrates that in some degree. So, so we have this list of variables, and we don't really know what their value should be. So we vary them from a low value to a high value and see if it makes a difference. And we've ordered them so that the one that has the biggest effect is at the top, the compliance weight. Compliance weight means how important do you think it is to comply with the legal requirement to re that says the, the oil rig leaseholders have to remove them at the end of their life completely and restore the ocean to its pristine state? And so, and the other ones, you know, there are various other objectives. And people have different opinions about this. These are really value judgments. And, but the, Interesting thing is, so, so that vertical black line is at zero. And it, if we have a positive utility difference, it means we favor partial removal. And if we have a negative value, we prefer complete removal. And if you have a high weight on compliance, then uh, you can see that it could, the total value could go negative. In other words, you, if, you, if you really think complying with that uh, lease agreement is critical, then yeah, you do want to do complete removal. But for all of the other parameters, 
if you just take them one at a time, none of them is sufficient to change the decision. So even though there's a lot of disagreement and uncertainty, in this case, they don't matter. So what this really simplifies the analysis, because what it means is that going forward, we really could just focus on compliance and how people felt about that. And the other issues, even though there were disagreements and some of them were uncertainties, you know, it wasn't really going to change the decision. So by doing this kind of sensitivity analysis, it can, you know, it tells you what to focus on, compliance in this case, and it tells you what you don't need to worry about, even though you might be uncertain about. So it can be extremely valuable. And uh, here's another example from the um, vehicle case, the 18. So in this case, um, we have a heap of variables there. It doesn't matter if you can't read them necessarily. Um, these are uncertain estimates that go into the model projecting, we're trying to project electric vehicle sales share in 2021. This was done a few years ago, um, although even like one year ahead is actually kind of challenging, but five years is very challenging. But we will look at the model projects how many people will buy electric vehicles based on a model of consumer preference that includes costs and convenience and availability and so on. The main point here, and so the horizontal scale is the electric vehicle sales share. And the main point is the top variable there is the price of oil. And so it turns out that the price of oil, if it went to the higher end, the possible price, uh, you know, could have a dramatic effect on EV adoption. Yeah, oh, so the red and the blue. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the red in this case is if that quantity is at low end, and blue is if it's at the high end. So if oil price is low, then PV sales will be, EV sales will be low. If it's high, they'll be high. For some of the other parameters, it goes the other way. So for example, the unit battery cost multiplier, which is about a third of the way down, you know, the higher the battery cost, the lower the EV sales, as you might expect. But, but the key point here is that, so predicting the price of oil is notoriously intractable. I mean, you know, it's been pretty low for the last few years. There was a spike, you know, when we thought there might be a war in Iran, um, or, you know, and, you know, it could still could happen before the election, perhaps. And, you know, the price of oil might go up to $150 a barrel. That would be dreadful, but it would be good for EV sales. But, you know, we don't know. But the point here is that, um, because if you want to, if your main goal is to get a better estimate of the future EV sales, you are going to be pretty limited by the fact that you can't predict the price of oil very well. And therefore, there's not a whole lot of value in developing a way more detailed model of all the other pieces. I mean, this is already a somewhat detailed model. Um, but even though we might be able to get better estimates for some of these other quantities, if we put more effort into it, find more data, the, if the main thing we care about is EV adoption rates, then uh, you know, it's going to be of limited value getting better estimates of those other quantities, given that we're not going to be able to get better estimates of the price of oil. So again, I mean, it's a negative and a positive message. I mean, negative, well, there's a limit to how accurately we're going to predict, be able to predict this. Positive for us as modelers, well, this is about as good as we can do, and anyone who's going to do better is going to be wasting that time. Yes. yes. But at least it can help you in building an optimal portfolio, because you know that they are going in optimal. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, for some people, this might be really interesting, you know, might be a good idea to hedge on, you know, maybe buy some EV shares and some oil shares, or, you know, might be something more sophisticated. But 
the uncertainty could be, and the volatility could be very interesting for some people. Yes? Um, this, this chart varies from the previous one, and it, you, you don't say utilities here because everything can be equated to costs. But on the previous one, you have people like Ward Edwards or Ron Howard mm -hmm. who say, well, you have to turn it into dollars or something. How, how did you manage to do that with the chart, the previous one that had utilities? Um, <coughs> Well, that's a great question, and you obviously understand how this stuff works. So, so I, I'm not going to say too much about it cause, just because of the lack of time. But um, so, so, you know, there are eight objectives that we put together here, and there's a multi-attribute decision analysis is sort of all about how do you combine those different objectives and you know each person may have different weights on them and actually you know what weights mean is a important thing in itself um, and I mean it sounds like you know this there are ways of doing that now Ron Howard in the Stanford School of Decision Analysis basically say well let's reduce everything to dollars and so um, you know let's start out with what's the cost of decommissioning and then okay if we care about the impact on marine mammals the sea lions then we ask questions about okay well suppose you know 100 sea lions would get hurt by removing these things in this way you know how much how many dollars would that be worth to you so you can play that game, and I certainly do on occasion, but the cool thing about this analysis is that it actually means you can get results without spending a lot of time on that, which those are difficult games, you know, and it's difficult to get people. You can get people to talk about, you know, dollar values for these quote, qualitative objectives, but in this case, we didn't really need to. The only thing we needed to care about was how much people worried about compliance. And compliance is kind of an odd thing because in a certain way, it's, there's a law. It had to be changed, and it actually was changed in the end, to allow the oil companies to leave the platforms in place or the bottom part take off the top platform. And, um, but some of, there were still some people especially in some of the environmental groups that felt like, well, it's not right to let the oil companies, you know, sign a lease saying they're going to reduce, remove the platforms and then let them off the hook, even if, as you'll see, if it kind of had some good benefits. So let me come move on to that. So this is just kind of a summary of what I'm talking about, agile analytics. So, um, you know, using influence diagrams to clarify the objectives kind of structure them with your clients. Start with a simple prototype, cycle, iterate, test, um, and, and so on. I'm gonna just finish up here talking about visualizing and communicating results. Actually, I'm not gonna talk about visualization in terms of designing beautiful charts and maps and so on. Not because I don't think that's fascinating and interesting, but I think that many of you have heard that and other people can speak about that better. I'm going to make a couple of particular points here. So, well, this is kind of a cute cartoon. Um, and indeed, in this um, <clears throat> platform decommissioning study, we did put together a 300-page report and handed it over to the stakeholders. And indeed, one of them said to me, couldn't you just you know, summarize it in one page? And I was like, that's irritating. And then I thought, well, actually, he's right. You know, we should do that. And so kind of this is that one page, essentially. So we, we really, after the analysis, realized there's only two meaningful options, you know, full removal or partial removal, essentially rigs to reefs, leave the bottom part as an artificial reef, which it turns out is good for the environment because there's all this marine life that's living on these. And the only 
bad thing, and it saves a lot of money because it costs a billion dollars to remove all 27 platforms completely, and maybe half a billion just to remove the top. So it saves half a billion dollars. The only thing is that some of the environmentalists couldn't quite get behind saving the oil companies half a billion dollars. So, um, so there was another wrinkle on this, which is to split the savings. Half of it goes to the operators, and the other half goes to a fund for marine conservation. And with that, everybody comes out ahead, and you know, we, it ended up with uh, legislation going through the California legislature and our uh, <coughs> governor, but, but two back, uh, Schwarzenegger signed it into, into law as one of his last things that he did. So, and you know, getting consensus on an issue of energy and environment is not a common thing, especially in the California legislature. So the last point about communication I wanted to say was, yes, it's great to have cool graphics, no argument, but what is really great is if you can have a model that your clients, your stakeholders can play with and you know, twist the dials and see what happens. Because you get a kind of understanding, a kind of visceral insight that you can't get just by hearing you know, my PowerPoint or whatever. And so, sorry it's these same guys here, but anyway. Um, so, so now, if you have a model that does in fact take a cluster of computers to run for several weeks, then obviously it's not very interactive. But even in that case, you can usually take the results from a bunch of different scenarios and make an interactive version from those results and then it turns out that playing with that is you know, really a great way to communicate things. So this is kind of my summary of what I've been saying. So, well, first of all, you know, I don't, engaging with clients isn't, gonna, isn't the only thing that you need to do to be successful, but I think it is perhaps one of the most important, if not the most important thing for many of us who have already mastered the kind of the technical skills for, for doing analytics. And you know, ask questions and listen. Help clarify our clients' decisions and objectives and certainties, sitting down with them, drawing up influence diagrams. Use agile methods to refine the model and refine it, driven by sensitivity analysis. And you know, finally, if you can, have a tool, have a model that your clients can interact with. So um, final point, really just reiterating it, the success of your analytics depends on the quality of your engagement with your client at least as much as on its technical quality. And the good news is, you know, we can learn this stuff. It took me a while, um, but you know, it became interesting and valuable. And I think you know, for those of you that already do it, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you that haven't so much, I'm sure you would get into it once you realize, once, especially once you realize that your satisfaction as an analyst, as a data scientist, really, I mean, we probably got into it for various reasons, but you know, I'm assuming you know, we like software, we like numbers, we like math and varying combinations. And, but ultimately we're doing this because it makes a difference in the world. It's helping people make better decisions. It's helping improve our world. And, you know, if you're like me and that's kind of ultimately what drives you, then, you know, this is really kind of an important point. Thank you. Okay. We have five minutes only. I'm sorry I went on a little bit long, but let's see. We had some questions as we went, so that was good. 
Does anybody? Yes. Just a comment. I got into it in high school. I decided my career was going to be applied science fiction. Applied science fiction. You want to see the? I want to see that baby walk. That baby walk, absolutely. And what, what does walking really entail? Getting deployed, getting used. Getting deployed, getting used. Absolutely. Thanks. Anybody else? So what is it like for somebody to work at Lumina and <laughs> Well, we'll say that later. We, we are hiring, by the way, if anyone is interested in working with us. That's Lottie's point. Yes. You need a subject matter expert as well as a technical expert. I mean, the other thing I want to say is, I think I didn't say, but which you, you remind me here, is that, um, I mean, there's, in schools, in classes, usually they don't, they some, occasionally they teach some of these soft skills, but not a whole lot. There's starting to be more classes in, in universities and so on. And even in some companies training in that area. Um, and you can learn quite a bit through classes and training, but ultimately, you know, you have to do it in practice. Ideally, you want to be working with, uh, you know, a mentor, with somebody with experience, and you know, see how it actually works out. Because um, you know, there's no substitute for real experience in learning this stuff. But still, you can you can get started pretty well. And so I think that might be related to what you were saying. Thank you.